Hello, my name is Sasha Shegi from the Chemical Engineering Program at the University of Connecticut. The article that this topic was inspired from was the American Institute of Chemical Engineers journal article, Modeling of a Continuous Rotary Reactor for Carbon Nanotube Synthesis by Catalytic Chemical Vapor Deposition, also known as CCVD. This research experiment investigated the CCVD method of carbon nanotube synthesis using an, an efficient reaction chamber model which used a continuous process. First, I'll briefly go over carbon nanotubes, also known as CNTs, their chemical composition and structure, and as physical properties as well. Then I'll go more in depth on the three different methods of carbon nanotube synthesis, one of which being catalytic chemical vapor deposition, the most efficient of the three methods. And I'll wrap up by uh, giving you some possible applications that carbon nanotubes can be used for. Carbon nanotubes are essentially very small tubes made solely of carbon molecules. Nano meaning tiny, and tubes, well, you can figure that out. You see, carbon, if chemically bonded correctly, contains very strong and resilient bonds. Take diamond, for example, one of the strongest substances known to man. Diamond is made solely of carbon molecules. The bonds on these molecules are all tetrahedral, meaning that a single carbon atom bonds to other carbon atoms at four different points. You see, in carbon nanotubes, these, bo these strong bonds are used to form a tube of carbon, which, due to the strong bonds, has incredible strength. These tiny tubes incorporate sp2 bonds, more specifically, two single bonds and a double bond, which are much stronger than the sp3 bonds found in diamonds. The length-to-width ratio of carbon nanotubes with efficient strength can reach up to 28 million to 1, a ratio that's far greater than any other substance at man's current disposal. The beauty of these nanotubes is that they can be bonded together end-to-end, -end, putting no limit on the length of the, of the nanotube. Carbon nanotubes have other extraordinary properties, such as their excellent conductivity as electricity and heat as well. The key fact here is that carbon nanotubes, because of their intense tensile strength and other properties, can be used for a very large number of applications. The only drawback is the actual production of carbon nanotubes. Despite our advancements in this field over the past decade, carbon nanotubes are still produced at a measured rate. Chemical engineers and nanophysicists have come up with a number of ways to produce this essential matter. I'm only going to cover three methods of synthesizing carbon nanotubes because they're the most efficient methods worth mentioning. The first method I will discuss is the electric arc discharge method. The synthesis of carbon nanotubes using this method is far simpler than the other two methods I'll go over later. This method implements two graphite electrodes. For those of you that don't know, graphite is made solely of thin layers of carbon. The electrodes are contained in the presence of an inert gas. An electric current is run through the electrodes ranging from 50 to 100 amps. The carbon of one electrode is vaporized and, depos and a deposit is produced on the other electrode in the form of a rod. The yield of this method for creating carbon nanotubes is potentially high depending on the temperature of the electric discharge. The drawback to this method of synthesis is that the carbon nanotubes are among a complex mixture of other materials. Therefore, more work is required in the actual separation of the carbon nanotubes from its byproducts. The yield using this method is around 30% by mass. This, in, this is in regard to all the products of the reaction. The next method we'll go over is the laser ablation method. This method gives us a higher yield than the previous method discussed upwards of 70% by mass of the products. In this method, a graphite sample is vaporized by radiation from a laser, usually an infrared laser. As carbon particles are broken apart, atoms form the nanotubes on the cooler surfaces of the reaction chamber. This process utilizes a catalyst to drive the reaction forward at a quicker rate, hence the higher yield. The method makes use of usually cobalt and nickel as the catalyst. The first laser pulse vaporizes the graphite sample, which produces synthesized carbon nanotubes among a bunch of suit and debris. A subsequent laser pulse is applied to more consistently break up the debris, feeding the carbon release into the existing nanotubes. The diameter and size of the nanotubes can be influenced by controlling the temperature that the reaction takes place, as well as the makeup of the, of the catalyst. The two methods discussed so far are good for procuring small samples of high-quality carbon nanotubes. Good for scientific study, but definitely not for mass production and wide-scale use. This is so because the graphite is vaporized in each case, resulting in the nanotubes among a tangled mess of useless carbon and metal debris. There is no easy way to separate the carbon nanotubes from the medley described at a fast enough rate for realistic purposes. This brings me to the final method I'll be discussing. Catalytic chemical vapor deposition 
makes use of carbon atoms from vaporous hydrocarbons such as ethylene and acetylene to supply the growth of the nanotubes. A catalyst is also required such as cobalt, nickel, or iron. The diameter of the nanotubes can be controlled by varying the size of the metal particles acting as catalysts in the reaction chamber. To grow the nanotubes, two gases are slowly admitted, one of these gases being the process gas, which usually is nitrogen, hydrogen, or a gas containing the two, and the other, of course, being the carbon-based gas, usually acetylene, but effective experiments have been done using ethanol, ethylene, and methane. The nanotubes grow beginning at the surface of the metal catalyst and expanding on from there. Because there is no vaporization of a graphite source to produce the nanotubes, there is no complicated separation of the nanotubes from debris at the end of the process, only nanotubes growing directly from the catalyst source. The reaction chamber is heated to a very high temperature for the process to happen. In most cases of CNT production using the CCVD method, the most efficient conditions to which carbon nanotubes can, produ can be produced using this method is no more than 700 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere of pressure. At pressures and temperature above this, the decomposition of the carbon-containing gas, usually ethylene, results in an unwanted suit in the reaction chamber among the CNTs. Engineers have developed clever mechanics of reaction chambers, involving rotational inclined chambers. The design is similar to a cement truck and the rotating cement container on the back of the truck. The catalyst, process, or carrying gas, and the carbon-containing gases are fed into the reaction chamber which is heated to the ideal temperature and pressure allowing the reaction to happen. The mobile bed rotary kiln in the diagram has a varying incline angle ranging between one half and five degrees while the rotating mechanism of the chamber varies between one half and five RPMs as well. The process constantly feeds in the gases and catalysts simultaneously under an inert pressure while the output gases are collected and the composition analyzed by a mass spectrometer. The force of gravity does all of the work, allowing the, produ the products of the reaction to be collected easily out of the end of the chamber. With more research like this occurring in the field of carbon nanotubes, costs of production have dropped drastically in the past decade. For example, the cost to produce one gram of carbon nanotubes in the year 2000 was $1,500. Today, that same cost may be from $50 to $100. The goal now is to make the production cost of CNTs to be as low as possible. There are many possible applications to which an extremely high tensile material can be incorporated with. As a side note, carbon nanotubes have and can be added to polyethylene, increasing its elasticity by 30%. With this in mind, it can be synthesized into fibers, allowing incorporation into waterproof, tear-resistant clothing. It can also be applied to combat protective suits, offering the wearer a lighter vest with enhanced protectiveness. One such test on protectiveness was conducted using material produced by means of carbon nanotube fibers with polyvinyl alcohol. The material required 600 joules per gram to break. Conventional Kevlar used in bulletproof vests requires 23, I'm sorry, 27 to 33 joules per gram to break. Carbon nanotubes can be implemented in recreational purposes such as sports equipment, allowing lighter and stronger tennis rackets, bicycle frames, snowboards, golf clubs, and baseball bats. It may be used in the automotive industry, one obvious example being an ultralight flywheel allowing much, fa much faster acceleration. One day carbon nanotubes may be put into action on suspension bridges, eliminating the need for steel cables and reinforcements and at the same time providing a much more stable structure. One day these nanotubes may be used in water filters as well. The nanotubes are small enough for water molecules to pass but are able to stop larger particles such as dissolved ions. Out of the three most efficient methods of carbon nanotube synthesis I've discussed, the catalytic chemical vapor deposition method is by far the best. It allows a continuous process rather than batch processes like the first two methods, which also require separation of the carbon nanotubes from its byproducts after each batch. CCVD allows a steady production rate of CNTs, and the process gives much higher yields compared to the other methods of CNT th synthesis, cutting down on production costs and making it less expensive to incorporate CNTs into the applications which could greatly benefit from them. That is the end of my presentation and here is a brief list of my sources. Any questions?